Good evening and welcome to another edition of CEO FaceTime. Well, my name is Raj Arya and today we have the privilege of interviewing Nazrin Hassan, the CEO of Cradle Funds in the Arambarhat. Nazrin, thank you for being on our show this evening. Thank you for inviting us. Right. Now, we know in this modern day and age, technology plays a very big part in the industries both in Malaysia and globally. Now, before we delve into this hot topic, can you just share with our viewers a bit about yourself? All right. Um, um, well, basically, I've uh, co-founded Cradle back in uh, 2003. Um, my background was actually in investment banking uh, with uh, CIMB Corporate Finance and there was a, a point when I was an entrepreneur and, uh, uh, and I was actually one of the top three uh, nationwide uh, business plan, one of the top three winners of the first nationwide business plan competition called Venture 2001. Uh, and when I became a, uh, one of the winners, uh, one of the things I realized was that, was that there was no early stage funding available at that time. Yeah. Uh, I started lobbying the, the government uh, via this organization called TEAM, Technopreneurs Association of Malaysia. Uh, and about two years after that, uh, Dr. Mahathir granted us uh, you know, the opportunity to start the Cradle Investment Program in 2003. So I was one of the co-founders of, of, of Cradle back in 2003. So we were the first uh, uh, grant funding program that was focused on uh, early stage funding, uh, namely uh, prototype funding. That's right. How much yeah. seed funding was given to you at that point in time? Uh, we were originally allocated about 100 million ringgit uh, in um, uh, 2003. Right, right. Yeah. Now, since you are the first in Malaysia, did you <laughs> use any base or a model in the, the setup? Because obviously you're starting from ground zero as sure. well. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, we, we had to take a look uh, at a lot of things, but because this was started by entrepreneurs, uh, I was an entrepreneur, and then um, my two co-founders, Tengku Farah Ritaudin of Skali and uh, Christian of TMS, were both successful entrepreneurs at that time. So what, how we structured it was basically we took a look at the needs of the early stage entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. What do they need? They need the funds, uh, they need the value add, they need the commercialization support. So we built the program around that. Uh, and as far as evaluation was concerned, uh, we took the evaluation criteria basically from a successful um, investment uh, model called the Harvard Framework, you know, where it was uh, successfully applied uh, in the University of Harvard. Uh, and we took that and that became the formula for evaluating uh, early stage companies. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and I think it's done relatively well because, uh, you know, over the last 10 years or so, um, our commercialization rate is now about 59% which is the, the highest uh, commercialization rate amongst grants in the country. Impressive indeed. Yeah. Now, uh, a quick question. As we all know, that it tends to be more geared towards uh, technological-based um, businesses as opposed to their, your traditional brick-and-mortar brick businesses, right? That, that was the plan all along? Uh, it, it is a, techno uh, a technology fund. So mm -hmm. basically, we are geared towards uh, helping startups uh, develop their prototype uh, and help them to go to market. So now we've got two kinds of products. One is the prototype funding, uh, where you can go from idea to prototype. And the other one is where you've got a prototype and you need to get to market, which is the commercialization funding. The first one is about 150,000 ringgit. The second one is about 500,000 ringgit. So small funding, targeted, uh, packed with value add, but uh, which would produce the right sort of outcomes for entrepreneurs. Right. Can you just share with us the journey over the last 11 years, from 2003 till today? Well, um, I think... Um, it's evolved quite a bit. Mm. You know, we, we started out as a grant player. Um, I, I started out in 2003. Uh, I left in 2005 to become an, an entrepreneur again. You know, uh, and in 2007, the, the basically the program had dwindled a little and the government had called me back to, right. to help turn around the program. Uh, and at that time, in 2007, we were made into a separate subsidiary. Uh, okay. uh, originally, we were under MathCap. Uh, and the turnaround process began and we, we had plans on how we were going to grow Cradle. So from the onset where we were just providing grants, we went on to um, provide uh, co-investment mm -hmm. uh, with uh, private and, uh, sorry, with uh, local and uh, foreign uh, investors. Uh, we, are also we also now have uh, a venture capital arm called Cradle Seed Ventures, which mm -hmm. is uh, um, a fund that focuses on uh, seed and startup stages. Um, we have also a, a coaching program called Coach and Grow, uh, which has coached about um, uh, anywhere about 600 plus um, um, uh, companies in the last uh, two seasons. Uh, and uh, I think in the recent Coach and Grow, you know, the graduates, 126 graduates accumulated about 453 million in sales. You know, uh, and we are also um, 
pushing the angel agenda in the country, angel investment agenda in the country via the Malaysian Business Angels Network. So basically, Cradle has evolved from just providing funds to providing you know um, other parts of the early stage value chain. So we are, we're an early stage ecosystem influencer. Uh, and uh, we're also trying to encourage private investment mm -hmm. because we realize that the government cannot keep pumping funds uh, into the ecosystem. The, the, the private sector side has got to be kick-started. So this is how we went about it, providing the government support, building up the government, uh, the private sector support. That's right. Now, you mentioned the term just now, angel investor. Yep. Now, for the benefit of our viewers out there, can you distinguish what an angel investor is and perhaps what, what a venture capitalist is? All right. Uh, in, in, in highly simplistic terms, an angel investor is an individual uh, that invests uh, in, uh, in a business at the very earliest of stages. It can be a tech business or it can be a non-tech business. It doesn't matter. You know, uh, but basically, he is investing his own personal monies. Uh, and usually it's what we call patient capital. He's putting in the money because he wants to support the startup, the entrepreneur, or he believes in the idea. Uh, and uh, frequently he also uh, provides his own value add mm. in order to help the company grow. Uh, whereas with the venture capitalists, uh, most of the time, well, not to say most of the time, but you know, there, there's two types. Some manage their own money, some manage other people's money or, or together with their own. Uh, but uh, the, the setup is a lot more professional, you know, um, and um, they, they mainly when we're talking about VCs, um, they're, they're more focused on the technology side of things, yeah. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, um, it, it's more structured and professional, I would say. Um, so mm -hmm. they're, they're not managing uh, as, as if it's their own money. Right, yeah. right. Now, only you mentioned that uh, Cradle Fund has, has shifted from giving out grants to equity co-investment. Now, mm. what resulted in this transition? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the grants, uh, well, the direction from the government was that uh, grant funding will have to be reduced um, gradually uh, mm. up till 2017. So we knew that uh, with decreased government funding, in order to avoid the ecosystem, the funding ecosystem from crashing entirely at the early stages, there had to be um, private investment coming in. And you know, what we had to deal with in Cradle was a lot of the deals that we funded in the earlier days were all running off to Singapore. Yeah, uh, Every single time we built up a company, the next round where they had to go for growth stage capital, they ran off to Singapore because Singapore generally has about seven times more venture capitalists than we do. So it's, it's, it's a flush with capital. Mm -hmm. and Considering that the deals go there, well, the risk has been mitigated by us. They, they become very attractive deals for the yeah. venture capitalists in Singapore. So I wanted to stem that tide and, and try to keep more of the guys that we funded over here. So uh, there's very little appetite locally uh, amongst our own private sector for venture capital. You know, uh, and the reason for it is simple. We're not at that stage of the economy where you get rewarded for taking a higher risk for a higher return. Right. Over here, you can still make a decent return in property or equities. Yeah. yeah? Uh, you you pump in your money into a property, chances are it will double right. within five to six. More years. traditional businesses and investments, right? Yeah. Particularly in property. So th th there's no encouragement for you to take a higher risk for a higher return. Yeah. Uh, where else? Um, you know, o over on 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 the other side. You know, there, there's very limited opportunity uh, for, for them to make money out of properties. And at the end of the day, people will have to invest in something that's higher value added. You know, so um, in order to attract private capital in, what we did was a one-to-one -one, uh, matching program where I can invite both um, foreign and uh, local capital to co-invest in a Malaysian startup, but by keeping the Malaysian deal over here. So in particular, this is leveraging on what Singapore already has. Mm -hmm. They have seven times more VCs and they want to take a look at Malaysian deals. And what we tell them is, you want to invest in a Malaysian deal? I'll match you one to one. Let's keep them deal in Malaysia. Right. Yeah? So in that sense, private capital is coming in. Yeah? And the deals are getting funded in Malaysia and we're not uh, encouraging a brain drain. That's right. I mean, that's a great idea. Now, we mentioned about local private uh, in investments as well from, mm -hmm. from the private sector side. Mm -hmm. Can you name a few notable companies who are very active in this uh, respect? Um, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, you mentioned the, yeah. the private sector plays yeah. a very big big part in it as well. Mm. Are there may, uh, an, any notable companies which are very active in, in, in this respect in terms of investing in well, potential new startups? On the local side, um, especially if you're talking about venture capital, um, 
there are only nine VCs left in the country now. Mm -hmm. uh, ev everyone else is in the private equity side. Right. On the VC side, there's nine VCs. Five of them are government owned. Right. The other four take some form of money from the government. 60 plus percent of total venture capital monies comes from the government. So it's highly government dependent. Mm. It's very, very difficult for me to create um, the, the, the appetite locally. Um, so if, if you're asking me to name the, the players, um, most of the players that I would name are people who are actually government players, <laughs> so that would be relevant. You know, but um, what we're seeing from the co-investment program is that we're starting to attract a lot of investors that's based in Singapore. So for instance, uh, Golden Gate Ventures was our first partner, right. you know, and then we've uh, been able to attract uh, Fatfish Ventures, uh, uh, Co-An Ventures, um, and uh, locally, we even OSK Ventures International has jumped in. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's very encouraging as well. So at least you know, we've been able to keep it at a pretty much a two to one ratio between foreign and local investors. Right. Yeah, but that's the way that you generate private investment. Otherwise, you know, it's not it's not going to move without us doing a matching arrangement. Right, makes a lot of sense there. Now, yeah. so hold that thought for a moment because we have to take a quick commercial break right now. But don't go away. When we come back, we will talk about more about VCs, startups, and perhaps something that might whet your appetite if you plan to start a new technological business. Stay tuned here on CEO FaceTime. <laughs> Um, as one of the um, key co-founders of the CJP, um, one of the ideas behind CJP uh, coming about was that we wanted to help technology startups uh, scale from one level to the next, from, from pre-commercialization to commercialization, from commercialization to growth, and from growth to going regional or global. And I think uh, over the last two seasons or so, um, uh, in both CGP1, CGP2, uh, all the CGP companies have done really, really well. Uh, and this year, I've been told that um, the graduating class of CGP2 has generated a total sales revenue of about 121.7 million, which is a really, really impressive achievement. And the total funds raised by all the companies have been about 23.9 million ringgit through both the public and private sectors. So for, for those who have achieved this, very well done to you. And um, I've noticed as well that there were a lot of notable companies that uh, have been grown through the CGP program. Some of them are household names now, like Sports Bole, Toothpay, Hyperband, Flexi Roam, and Radica Software. All right, uh, congratulations to all of you. I'm, I'm really, really proud uh, that you guys have done really, really well. Uh, and um, um, well done to you. Uh, and I wish you all the best in your future business endeavors. You're back with me, Raj Arya, on CEO FaceTime with Najrin Hassan, the CEO of Cradle Funds in Berhad. Now, earlier we have talked a bit about the historical development, the evolution of Cradle Fund. Uh, now, can you just tell us, perhaps, what are the challenges you see in this very dynamic uh, environment we're in right now, especially in 2014 going on to in, in 2015? Well, um, the challenges 10 years ago when we first started out was that there was very little early stage funding. Yeah, uh, and um, it was a bit of a ridiculous situation because at that time you had venture capitalists, but none of them did the early stages. So I always said to them that, you know, it seems like, you know, people were building up universities without any primary schools. <laughs> you know, the Jumping the gun. Eh? Yeah, the equation was a bit lopsided. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, I think that 10 years later, the challenge is not about starting up anymore. I think, I think we've somewhat resolved that problem. Those who are good actually do get an opportunity yeah. to start up. We've seen uh, people like iMoney succeed, people like MyTaxi, GrabTaxi mm -hmm. succeed, people like Carlis, people like PictoChart. All these companies were once funded by Cradle at one time or another. So people, good people do have an opportunity to start up and succeed, you know, not only at, uh, the, at the local level, but we've seen it at the regional level as well. We, we've created some regional champions. The challenge now is for more of the companies that we've created to scale. This is the new challenge. You know, many of the companies that we've created are within the one to five million range. Mm -hmm. You know, they may be, say, typically a team of five to 15. Uh, and it's a very comfortable lifestyle business, you know, and some of them are, are, are young millionaires and, and they're very comfortable. You know, the challenge is to get them to go beyond national borders. To the next level. To huh? the next level, to right. grow at a regional or global level, to penetrate new markets. That is the real challenge because it involves an entirely new skill set, uh, new exposure, new level of focus entirely. Uh, and I, I think going forward, 
this is what Malaysian startups are going to be faced with. We, we need to increase our exposure to what's happening in the region mm. and globally and to benchmark uh, our best practices against what the others are, are doing uh, around the world. I mean, if I take a look at Indonesian startups and the, 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 the Philippine startups, they're a lot more hungry. Um, I if you look at events that's held in Singapore, I remember when you know, I first went to this event called Ishlon, um, I think three years ago, um, there were so many entrepreneurs uh, from Indonesia, so many entrepreneurs from the Philippines, and they all had to fly to Singapore. Mm. It's not as if they can go across That's the right. causeway. And, but there were so many more of them, and I was one of 10 Malaysians. There was all of 10. Yeah? Uh, and what we did in order to get Malaysia into the game was to sponsor for the Ishalon event to come to Malaysia. You know, so we did Ishalon Malaysia Cradle sponsored that. This year, in the latest Ishalon, I think last year, in the latest Ishalon, um, in Singapore, uh, I think we had about 400, so, sorry, 200 plus participants, or 246 or something like that. Right. We were the second largest grouping in Singapore. Right. So I think a lot of it has to be about encouraging our startups to get regional exposure as well. Once you start benchmarking against your regional peers, then you, you will find that one, you're no more inferior than any of them. Right. Like in fact, in some ways, we're superior. But two, that we need to have the courage to go beyond our own region because everyone else is doing it. Why is the hunger and courage so much more among the, the Filipinos and Indonesians? Is it in part because maybe Malaysians are somewhat spoiled because of the support given by the government that they don't have the, the grit or the resilience to, to think big? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Hmm. Um, it's, it's not an easy <laughs> question to, 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 to answer. But I, I think... Um, I mean, let's take the Indonesians, for example. The local domestic market is huge. Mm -hmm. yeah? So even if you were just succeeding in Jakarta, you know, you're literally succeeding in a country scale-wise for, for other people. Almost like Malaysia. Almost <laughs> like Malaysia. You know? So uh, I I in that sense, uh, they're, they're, not, they're not limited uh, in, in their thinking. They're, they're thinking that, look, I can do really well on my local market. I can build a base. And if I can succeed in this big market, I can succeed in other smaller markets as well. So the transition from going to from a big market to a small market is not so challenging. Right. You know, where else we've always had this, you know, Malaysia cukup lah mentality. Mm, you know, if I'm the true. national cukup champion, makan, yeah. you know, if I'm the national champion, Jago kampung, uh, eh? if I'm number <laughs> one or two in Malaysia, then I I have it made. You know, uh, and I think well, it's not bad in itself, and not not all companies w w want to scale mm. regionally. I mean, that's that's a fact. Some people are comfortable being lifestyle businesses, but at the end of the day, I think if we were going to see bigger success stories, we need to get that appetite and hunger and benchmarking going on amongst our regional startups. That's right. Uh, and the government has taken some measures towards this. I mean, the the advent of Magic, Magic, right. the Malaysian Global Innovation and Creativity Centre, of which I'm a board member of as well. You know, has been set up in order to encourage more of our Malaysian startups to go global. Uh, and I think over time, um, we'll, we'll probably do better in that, in that sense. Right. Now, speaking about role models and whatnot, of course, this year, uh, well, uh, we, we have seen quite, quite recently Jack Ma and Alibaba. So that, that would be something where people can look. And I think he did it over a span of a mere, what, 15-odd years. So it, it shows that the potential to go big on a global uh, platform, it is actually possible, isn't it? It is possible. It is. It is. It is very, very possible. And I think there's there's a, a, a few different models in which you can can do that. I mean, I even if we take a look at locally, Job Street. Mm -hmm. Job Street was a you know a, a, at the end of the day was a billion ringgit play uh, over a period of uh, 18 years as well. You know, so uh, it can grow that way. Uh, or one of the other popular things that's going on right now is that many of our startups are preparing themselves in certain verticals. Uh, becoming the national champions of those particular countries and are getting acquired by larger companies mm -hmm. either in the West or That's in Australia. Right. Uh, Australia. Australian companies are particularly fond of uh, picking up our companies in order to package them into a, a listed entity on the Australian Stock Exchange. You know, so that's the other way of, of doing it, packaging yourself in order for you to be acquired by a, a bigger mm -hmm. entity. Uh, and uh, well, some have just gone uh, regional, you know, like um, iMoney and uh, Grab Taxi and everything mm. like that. That's right. And uh, procuring foreign uh, venture capital. And this is one of those things that, that I want to highlight. People see value in our startups. You know, Ching Wei, you know, the guy who started out iMoney, I, I first spotted him when his company was seven weeks old in, in a program called Make the Pitch. And, and you know, even at that time, I knew that this was the guy to back. If, if you look at him, he knew his business, he was passionate, he was humble, he was open to input. 
uh, and you, you just knew that this was the guy who was going to succeed. Two and a half years later, was 80 million ringgit, his company, and he's, he's well on his way to becoming a regional player. You know, so uh, foreign investors do pump in money into our, our startups. Grab Taxi raised USD 250 million re recently from SoftBank. And I, I think that, of all things, should provide an inspirational point for all our other startups. I mean, we can complain about how incomplete the ecosystem is, how things can yeah. be better and everything like that. But there are guys who are using the current resources and they have grown and they are attracting foreign venture capital and they are succeeding on the global front. So there should be no excuses for others not to. That's right. That's right. Well said. Now, as, as we know, uh, startups can come in various forms. Now, which particular niche uh, is getting popular these days? I mean, for example, is it more on the, the, the smartphone app side, the, the, the lifestyle, focal points? What, what do you think is the trend these days which uh, has the potential to, to go big? Well, um, I think what we're seeing lately is uh, a lot more mobile applications and cloud applications. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and um, uh, a lot more consumer-driven stuff. Where, you know, uh, if if you're shopping and uh, the, the the shopping mall can basically you know detect your presence and you know um, know exactly what to push to you advertising-wise and things like that. You know, so um, those sort of consumer-driven B two C sort of technologies are, I think, becoming more prevalent. Uh, and the appetite from the investors as well, probably because of the scalability, is more towards the B2C place. Yeah, uh, I, I think I see fewer and fewer uh, B2B plays coming mm -hmm. up nowadays right. as, as, as opposed to 10 years ago. Right. You know, uh, we are seeing a lot more consumer plays lately. Right. Yeah. Well, now it's a more level playing field, as we all know. Uh, but on the flip side of things as well, competition is so much greater as well. We are talking yeah. about millions of applications out there as well. So what, what do you think is required for you to stand out among the masses out there? <laughs> you know, it's, it's not easy, it's not easy to, 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 to really pinpoint something. I mean, let, let's talk about taxi applications. My taxi is definitely not the only one. That's right. You know, there are taxi applications galore. That's right. You know, but what I think uh, Anthony Tan has done well is that he's, he's, you know, basically accumulated the whole strategy of how to make it work as a business. He knew exactly who to engage, you know, uh, and how to scale the fastest amongst the other players. That's right. Perhaps they didn't have the relationships. Perhaps they didn't have the strategy. Perhaps they did not have the planning for the fundraising. I think Anthony uh, had it mapped out uh, well uh, mm -hmm. early uh, and uh, he executed it very well. A at the end of the day, it all boils down to execution. It's, yeah. not, the, it's not just the plan, it's That's not right. just the, 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 the people. Uh, if, if they can execute, they'll do it better than the next guy. That's right. Well said, well said. Well, we're running out of time right now. Mm -hmm. One final word for you for our would-be uh, potential startup entrepreneurs out there. What are the couple of criterias you think they need to have in order to take it to the next level? Um, next level as in from currently where they are right. in order to grow? That's right. You know, I think one of the things that one of my mentors, Dr. Siva, always say is that we've got to think big. You know, and, and you know, we, we can only think big as Malaysians if we realize that you know, there's, there's a whole market to be conquered out there outside of Malaysia as well. You don't, don't just think about Malaysia, think of the markets outside, expose yourself to the countries outside of Malaysia and realize that the opportunities out there may be even easier to clinch than the ones in Malaysia. That'd be quite so ironic, isn't it? <laughs> a, 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 actually, most of the startup place would, would tell you that sometimes it's easier to get clients out there than it is in Malaysia. So, um, you know, the, the mental block should be removed because at the end of the day, if you're good, people will realize that you're good and they'll pick up your services. That's right. Take the risk. Huh? Take the risk. Go, go for big. it. Go big or go home. Well, with that, Nazreen, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you much. Yeah. Uh, as you can see, something very, very riveting, something very relevant in today's modern day and age. My name is Raj Arya. I hope you enjoyed this edition of CEO FaceTime. We will see you same place, same time next week. Take care and have a great evening.
benar atau tidak? Kami adalah generasi Y. Ikuti kami dalam Citra Gen Y. Kat lepas